Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vanderbilt University and the Center for Latin American Studies for having me, for inviting me. Um, last night I was at Tennessee Tech and I was very far from Haiti. I felt very far from Haiti. Um, a wonderful campus, wonderful uh, students, faculty, and staff. Um, however, this is a warm, very warm welcome. And I am so honored and excited and appreciative that there is a Haiti week all the way here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, so that makes me feel proud. Uh, and I'm so grateful that people are, have an interest in Haiti the way that uh, universities across the countries have exemplified. Um, so I, I'm happy to share my personal experiences uh, through this novel, American Street. Um, and, th and thank you for noticing that I was, I've been very productive in the last two years. But I must say that uh, it took me 15 to 20 years to get published. So a lot of that along, uh, I was writing for a very long time, trying to tell different kinds of stories. And my first novel was more of a personal one, um, one that tells a story of a girl immigrating from Haiti. That is not the first story that I tried to, to tell or to sell when I was trying to get published. Um, however, um, I think publishing wanted more personal stories. They want immigrant stories, and they want stories from Haiti. There have been novels by non-Haitians that's been published um, in the past five to ten years that's won awards. So I'm grateful that I was able to tell uh, what the publishing community calls hashtag an own voices story. So own voices meaning someone who has had that experience is writing from that experience as opposed to someone who has not. Um, so that's been the history of novels about Haiti and Haitian characters over the years. So I want to show you really quickly that um, <clears throat> I have a very cerebral, I had a very cerebral lecture prepared for a college visit. Um, this is very, very uh, intellectual in terms of talking about Haiti from a, the Vodou spiritual traditional narrative and what it means to retain that narrative in the face of failed American dreams. So the horror part of it is when people come from a broken country or the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere to move to even poorer cities in the United States and the kind of horrors that immigrants confront, what does that mean um, from a mythological and spiritual standpoint? But we're not going to go there because we're educators and I'm going to share the presentation that I share with young people and make it more personal. What I've realized after doing both lectures over the past couple of years, um, it's easy to frame Haiti within an intellectual uh, framework, meaning Haiti is an idea, Haitian history is an idea, Haitian people are an idea, but I rarely hear or see people talk about Haiti from a very personal perspective in that I'm someone from Haiti, I'm an immigrant, what did, that, what did my journey mean? What does it mean for me to be an immigrant and Haitian woman? So this is why I chose to write, uh, to share more of a personal story. And this is my personal journey. Um, and these are very personal photos. There's no bullet points or anything like that. So I'm waiting for this to start. It's going to start. <laughs> so um, please just come with me on this journey of how I became a writer and what it means for me to come from the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And I probably said this three times already because that's what the media has spun and that's what my fellow Haitians have believed. That's what your students in your class will believe. Uh, I just moved from Brooklyn. I was priced, my family and I were priced out of Brooklyn and we moved to a town um, in Maplewood, New Jersey. And my daughter, my, I have a 16 and 14 year old, my ninth grader just started a new high school. And she just told me that, oh wow, there are a lot, way more Haitians than I thought in this town. And I was very proud. But she said, like, why is everybody talking about Haitian as if a joke? Um, and how there are, you know, non-Haitians in the school and somebody had walked into a classroom and said, it smells like Haitian in here. And she'd never heard that. Um, and coming from Flatbush, where there's a large population of Haitians, but it seems like in this part of New Jersey, there are more recent immigrants, maybe, I don't know, or it's much more, the Haitian population is much smaller than in Flatbush, Brooklyn, where there's a large population. My point is, there are still stereotypes about black immigrants coming from other countries. 
Uh, and I had to talk to her about what it was like to grow up in Haiti, um, as a Haitian immigrant in the 80s. Um, and when I was growing up, I heard very mean things from other kids who looked like me. So it's so important to share these stories of young people navigating America from other countries. Um, so the, Haiti is not on the news in terms of immigration policy, uh, but there are still Haitian immigrants. There are West African immigrants. There are immigrants coming from other Caribbean nations who face hostility, not only from the larger American population, from, but from, their kids in the, from the kids in their own classrooms, from kids who look just like them because they have a funny name, they come from a country that's always on the news, or they dress funny. So here's my uh, story. I think we all know where Haiti is, right? But before I start, I do this with every presentation, almost every presentation. I almost forgot to do it with you, but I think this is a fun group, and let's just have a little fun right now. If you don't mind, I hope you have a free hand to raise it in the air and wave it from side to side. And I do want you to wave it from side to side when you're ready to answer my question to show some level of pride and enthusiasm as to whatever your answer may be. But this is my way of gauging what the population is like across the country. Um, I'm collecting data. Um, I'm researching. Uh, so probably this is post-novel research, but it's always fascinating to see what the responses are. And it's, it'll be fascinating for you as well um, to see what the responses are of your colleagues and fellow staff members. So when I, whatever the answer is, raise your hand and wave from side to side. So I'll start with the first question. Are we ready? Yeah. All right. <laughs> raise your hand and wave it from side to side to show some pride. If and only if you were born in a different country. Raise your hand, immigrants. Hey, look around. Surprising, huh? Okay. That's not a lot. Raise your hand and wave it from side to side if and only if you have at least one parent who was born in another country. Look around. Oh, we have a few more. Okay. First generation in the house. Raise your hand and wave it from side to side if you have at least one grandparent who was born in another country. We have a few more. Okay. Raise your hand and wave it from side to side if you have at least one, did I say great grandparent? Grandparent? Grandparent, right? I said grandparent. Great grandparent born in a different country. Look around. All right. I think is that second generation, first generation? Second. Okay. Raise your hand and wave it from side to side if at least one of your ancestors came from a different country sometime in the 1900s. Look at that. Look at that. All right. How about mm, the 1800s? You're pretty sure. Raise your hand. 1800s? Okay. All right. At some point, and I'm, this is just a, the, the short version, at some point, everyone in the room, almost everyone in the room raises their hand. Now I didn't ask, I didn't ask you if a parent or a grandparent was an immigrant. I asked if they'd come from another country. And as I progress with th those questions, I asked if anyone in the room, and I'll ask you now, if anyone in the room knows for sure that they have an ancestor who came through Ellis Island. Oh wow, look at that. And anybody in this room know for sure that they have an ancestor who did not come here by choice? Raise your hand. Okay. And by choice meaning what part of the transatlantic slave trade? Raise your hand. Okay. All right. That's not the same kind of immigrant story. Now, I was called out in a Las Vegas middle school when I asked these same questions but there were three children in the room who did not raise their hand for any reason and it was an enthusiastic group where even the teachers were participating and they mentioned that they said we're Native American so they were they lived on a reservation in Nevada um, so this is one instance where we cannot say that we're all a nation of immigrants. Um, and this was where these students felt invisible in this little interaction that we just had. 
So in that sense, I do this, and I've done it in an uh, auditorium with as many as two, three hundred students. And faculty participate. And it's very empowered, empowering for students to look around at the teachers to see who's raising their hands. And it's very empowering for the teachers to look at the students to see who's raising their hands. Because some students that we think are immigrants are not. Some students that we think are native are immigrants. So, and these conversations don't come up. And of course, New York City, it'll be a class of uh, room full of, um, no, actually, the most surprising um, reaction I've gotten to this uh, activity was in Connecticut, in Westport, Connecticut, where it was a homogenous group of white children in a very, very wealthy public school. And I'm sorry. Um, and I thought, hey, nobody here is an immigrant, right? Not even first generation, maybe. But Almost the whole school was first generation. And I was surprised to see that these seemingly very American looking children were first and second generation immigrants in, a, in this very wealthy town. And somehow the teachers knew this and I was like, what? Whoa. <laughs> you know, so in terms of uh, many um, were coming from Europe, there were European um, immigrants um, and Eastern European and Russian immigrant children in this very wealthy town and that's a very different kind of immigrant story that we don't usually see. So in any case the immigrant story, the immigrant narrative and immigrant novel is very important for our young people. It's so necessary to ha push them past this American centric narrative that they have and get them to see the world as on the global stage. To see children to see human beings from a very global perspective and hopefully our curriculum can move move past this Eurocentric worldview. So of course Haiti is in the Caribbean and shares an island with the uh, Dominican Republic. And I'm going to move a little quickly so I can get through the end. So here is where my immigration story begins, right? I like to say that. I can say I can go back to as far as the Haitian Revolution, maybe, but for this particular narrative, I want to start with a dictatorship. Um, and for the purposes of our current political climate, I love talking about dictatorships with young people. Um, and I, you know, and I um, begin with uh, Haiti's first brutal dictator, Francois Duvalier, who made himself president in 1956. He was democratically elected somewhat, and once in office, he said, no more elections. I'm the president for as long as I live. Now, how do you think someone can gain that sort of power and maintain it throughout the course of their lives? Tell me three things that a person can do to maintain that sort of power in a country like Haiti. Let's keep it very simple. What do you think? Yes. Fear. Fear. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, unpack that a little bit. One example of fear. Uh, like, like military presence. Okay. Military presence. In Haiti, they were the Toto Makut, which literally means Uncle Boogeyman or something like that. But it was just a nickname given to them because the idea was that they'd come and get you in the middle of the night if you were behaving badly, right? That was, some, that was kind of like a monster figure told to, a story told to children, and they applied that folktale to these henchmen, to the police's, to, uh, to the president's henchmen, right? Fear, military. Give me two more things. Control of resources. Control of resources, yes. Um, during his presidency, um, they made a deal with um, Arkansas rice farmers to, uh, to bring subsidized rice to Haiti. And this drove the native rice farmers out of business. And therefore, Haitian farmers were no longer able to stay in business and support themselves. Uh, so that's one way, cons uh, you know, controlling farming the food industry, um, that sort of resource. Yes. Anything else? One more. One more. Let's, let's be dramatic here. Let's be dramatic. Yeah. Uh, control of information, journalism. Yeah. Maybe. Propaganda. Journalists had no power. They were, what happened to them? What would happen to journalists? 
Yeah. What's another word for killing? Murder. Murder. You know, kids get excited about that <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, so basically, kids and young people get that immediately. How do you maintain? You kill people. They get really excited. And I'm like, yeah, basically, basically, no, this is not happening here. But then we peel back the layer and talk about propaganda and journal, you know, journalists and controlling resources and all of that. There was a political prison in Haiti called Fall Dimanche. So basically, yes, it was violence. And there was something called the brain drain in Haiti where most of the intellectuals, your lawyers, your PhDs, your scholars, your teachers were leaving the country in droves because they feared that sort of oppression. And some of their brightest people were no longer in the country and could not move the country forward the way it needed to be because of the dictatorship, or they were killed, right? So uh, when Francois Duvalier passed away, he made his son president, this young man here. So in, um, he is still the youngest man to ever preside over a country since 1900. There has been no other person who's been made president younger than the age of 19. At 19, he became the president of Haiti. And soon after, he was forced to marry one of the wealthiest, uh, marry into, or have a wealthy family marry into his family. Anyway, that woman there was the daughter of one of the wealthiest businessmen in Haiti, Michel Benet. For some of the, um, I don't know if um, some of you were following the news, early 80s, I was a child. But I remember um, the Times putting out an article, my mother had the clipping, called Dragon Ladies. And they were um, documenting these like very wealthy diva-esque first ladies across the globe. Michelle Bennett was one of them because this wedding cost $30 million. And uh, I don't know if some of you remember Melba Marcos from the Philippines and her collection of shoes. And they were the two women highlighted because Michelle Bennett had a fridge, like a meat, meat refrigerator that they would store meat in. Um, she had one um, built into the castle, and not castle, palace, and she stored her fur coats there. And they had a wine cellar in Haiti. This is a tropical island. So basically, this is part of the corruption that was, is part of my, this is the corruption that's part of my immigration story. And it also starts here. Um, and I like sharing personal photos so young people know that I'm not an idea, that I'm a real person, right? So my mother is on the other side of the glass, and I ask young people, what does this look like? This, this photo looks very old to them. This is before iPhones. Um, what does this look like here? What's going on here? Recording studio. Recording studio, radio station. It's a radio station. It's a radio station, and my mother was a broadcast journalist. My, broad, my mother reported the news. Do you think it's a safe job to have under a dictatorship? <laughs> my mother had a beautiful speaking voice, which is how she got that job. She basically read the news, but she also reported it. She would write it down eventually. Um, she started out just reading out the news, but eventually her passion grew for journalism and telling the truth about what was going on in that community, Lekai. Um, the second um, radio station opened up in Haiti. So this was in the early 70s. Um, and my mother had, was, um, could speak French very flu fluently, and she spoke Creole, this sort of Creole French. Creole can be fancy, or it could be like guttural, you know, <laughs> like African-American vernacular. You can go up or down. Um, so this is how she became a broadcast journalist. But it became more dangerous based on the news she was reporting. And the idea was that these henchmen, the Tonton Makut, the militia, um, would any, any news that you would hear about anybody talking bad about the government, uh, the stories would be that they'd go to bed you know, one night and then you'd hear a knocking on the door in the middle of the night and poof, they're gone, right? And these are the stories that my mother would tell. And this put her at risk. Right? This put her in a lot of danger. Another thing that happened was that my mother was a little pretty young thing, uh, and this is Haiti. And what form of oppression can exist in a country like Haiti? And this is what I ask about, um, ask high schoolers. What do you think? Sexual assault. Yes, and it starts with a P. 
and th Jewish nope, property. not that. Okay, Jewish nope. Prostitution? Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> All of that is part of the larger oh, umbrella yeah. called P patriarchy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> High schoolers get it for you know. These things are part of their language that I didn't have that vocabulary when I was in high school, like misogyny and patriarchy or whatever. Destroy the patriarchy, they love saying stuff like that. So when I ask this question, they get it. Yeah, patriarchy. You know, we don't get to sexual assault or prostitution. But um, so here my mother is a single woman with a job and a beautiful speaking voice. She's vulnerable in somewhere like Haiti. Yes, sexual harassment. Yes, the potential for sexual assault. And I have a, an essay on that called Forgiving My Father, the Serial Rapist. Um, and my father, is not, it's not in the same way that we think of it in the West. It's more subtle in that women have no other uh, choice than to submit. There is no fighting in somewhere like Haiti because the patriarchy is so oppressive, right? My mother can't go and file a loss, sexual harassment lawsuit, you know, against a guy who's employing her in a country like Haiti. So I am a result of that sort of relationship. My father was 30 years older than my mother, and he already was married with two other children. So I was a quote unquote love child. It was a complicated relationship. But in the end, my mother became a single mother. In a, in a country like Haiti. Um, and ultimately, she could no longer work in the radio station. But she tried, she wanted to stay in Haiti, of course, and she went for after her second dream job, Plan B, um, which, is to, which was to become an educator. At this point, my mother had traveled to France and Belgium, um, and she was very well educated. And that educating, education came with the price. So I, I think we're familiar with the term of sugar daddies. There is this idea of wealthy men taking on these younger women um, and helping pay for their education or giving them a job. They usually work as secretaries and they would have these families. So this is the sort of environment that, be, that would be in a country like Haiti. And it's in other parts of the world too. And when I share these stories with young people, you'd be amazed how many students wake up and say, yes, that happened in my country too, right, in terms of the role of the, the, the circumstances of young women in these countries. It's not always sexual violence, it's more subtle, right? And this is very, this is overt but subtle, right? Um, so my mother tried to work as a teacher and in Haiti, the paying jobs were um, the Catholic schools uh, and they were not co-ed, all, all girls Catholic school, all boys Catholic school. So she applied to some of the top Catholic schools. She had the credentials. She applied, and do you think she was able to get a job? Why not? Why not? And I asked young people this. She was only one Single mom. Single mom. Yep. Single mom. It's not a good example for young ladies <laughs> to be taught by a woman who had a child out of wedlock. Are you kidding me? This is not 1950s either. I'm not that old. I, I hope. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Um, this is so where, and this is like, you know, probably this is the height of the feminist movement here, right? No such thing here. So where do you think she could go where people don't care if she's a single mother? America. No prisons. You said <laughs> probably America, right? <laughs> um, so yes, um, my mother decided to leave Haiti and this is, is this a typical immigrant story? This is not a typical immigrant story. Uh, money is involved, but it not in the way that you think. My mother could have gotten a job, right? If she didn't have me or if she was married, right? Um, because the opportunities were there at the time for someone of her caliber, right? Um, there was food, there was shelter. Because in Haiti, no one, in this narrative that they tell you that people are going hungry, Yes, that's true. At the same time, people do come together to share resources, right? My mother would not go hungry if she did not find a job. She was an ambitious woman. Now, I, this is out of order a little bit. Now, um, this is, I say my sister in quotes here because 
in leaving Haiti, I want young people to know what I was leaving behind, right? Leaving Haiti, immigration is not an idea. It is, there are things that you leave behind, people that you leave behind, and feelings and memories, right? My strongest memory of Haiti of this little girl beside me, right? At four years old. I remember my little friends in Haiti. You could see me. You could see same little face. Um, my cousin and my little friend next to me. I always kept this picture because these are the, those, they, those two were the strongest memories as a child, as a very small child. So just remember this picture. I'll be coming back to it later. This is the last picture I took in Haiti, um, Toussaint Louverture um, Airport, looking very apprehensive because I was leaving warm sunshine, food, family, friends. Uh, if I remember stepping outside the house and I was not amongst strangers, uh, the family was the whole town, basically, right? Um, and, th and the streets are structured that way. Um, Haiti was, um, you know, yes, there were things that happened. At the same time, there was the familiar, familiarity, familiarity of language and culture and customs, right, that made it feel as if everyone was your family. <laughs> I don't look happy. Now, do you think when people move from disenfranchised um, countries, do you think they're moving into wealthy suburbs? Are they moving to Tony cities, large cities, and uh, fancy apartments? Most times we are moving into equally or even more so disenfranchised cities and neighborhoods. And the trauma of immigration, that's part, the huge part of it. Because, yes, if there's trauma and violence where you're coming from, at least you can get together with family and friends and experience it together. Right? I'll share a little bit about that. You're not alone in your trauma, right, from your home country. America, you're alone. So this is not my picture. These kids look a little rough. <laughs> now, now, this is um, a photographer who worked as a teacher in Bushwick in the late 70s and 80s. And she also took pictures of Studio 54. Um, a famous photographer, Mer Meryl, I, her name escapes me right now. But she um, had stored all these film, all these this film in her box in boxes, and a few years ago discovered them and decided to print them, and did a show. And it was groundbreaking because no one had documented Bushwick, Brooklyn, in such a way. No one was going out there to take pictures of the locals. Um, and at this point, she was part of the community and was able to document young people that this way. Um, so these were some of her students. And this is what Bushwick looked like when I moved there. There were blocks, decent blocks with, you know, with trees, but then you could turn the corner and this would happen, right? And this is not happenstance. Um, I'm, you probably heard of the blackout of 1977 in the summer of Sam, right? Hey, uh, New York City was on the decline. New York City was basically bankrupt in the 70s. Uh, and by the 80s, you get neighborhoods looking like this. The Bronx is burning. Uh, Harlem looked like this and parts of Brooklyn looked like this. What happened is there was a large amount, there was large, huge unemployment. People could not pay their rents. When people could not pay their rents en masse, meaning the whole building wasn't paying rent, the landlord had to do something. The landlord could not pay the heating bill or the water bill, right? And therefore, people were suffering in these tiny apartments. And landlords were abandoning buildings left and right. And the way that they were able to make some money, um, they would pay arsons to burn some uh, the buildings down. And that's part of the story of the Bronx is burning, uh, and which is why a lot of these buildings were burnt down or burnt out or dilapidated uh, because they were abandoned. And when that happened, the insurance, uh, insurance company would pay the landlords for a burnt down building. This was happening all over New York City, but still people had to live in these neighborhoods. So this was the neighborhood that my mother could afford. Now, um, Bushwick 
was not, it was terrible, but at the same time, it was a community filled with immigrants who still held on to their community, to, to, who still held on to, the, to their dignity and faith. This is part of my mother holding on to her dignity. We were in America now, right? There was free education, somewhat, um, and she dressed me up to go to school. Mind you, this was picture day, but basically this was close to it. If it was uh, any school day, I was wearing a dress to school and socks and getting my hair done in bows while the other kids looked like this, right? <laughs> This was part of pride and dignity. And sometimes I was the only kid who looked like this, but these kids were not nice to me for looking like this. This is another way that we held on to our cultural traditions. The community was filled with immigrants and a lot of us were Catholic. And we would go to church every Sunday and this was First Holy Communion. And I wasn't the only one. Uh, I was in a neighborhood with uh, other Caribbean um, kids, some recently immigrant, some first generation from Dominican Republic, from Puerto Rico, from Panama, from uh, Costa Rica. My friends were, th were all immigrants and the Catholics, so there were two schools on a block in my neighborhood. There was the public school and the Catholic school. The Catholic school was all immigrants, right? The public school was also immigrant. Uh, but there were clashes, right? <laughs> there were, you know, it's not that the Catholic school kids had more money. It's that the parents made that choice and worked hard to pay that little tuition. And my mother was one of them for a while. Something happened in high school. I skipped middle school because it's traumatic. <laughs> There's a huge transition that happened here. And what I like to do with the young people is say, this is American me immigrant me. American me, immigrant me. What do you think happened? American. This is what I asked the young people. What happened? Americanized. Americanized, yes. Give me two other words. Assimilated. Assimilated. Assimilation and another one. Yep. Huh? Integration. Integration and adapt. I adapted. Adaptation, right? Uh, I could not do this through high school, right? <laughs> they would slaughter me. So at some point, I looked like everybody else, and I didn't even have to say that I was immigrant, right? Except for my name, right? I, there was no accent in high school. And I went to a all-white high school in Fresh Meadows, Queens. Um, I went to a fancy Catholic school. Um, I don't know if you know the Gaudis. Um, I went to school with gaudy sons and gaudy nephews. So in that sense, it was pretty fancy. And I could blend into American culture. I could, it wasn't about blending into my community anymore and interacting with kids in my neighborhood. I was interacting with a larger American population. Now was the Italian and Irish kids in my um, high school, the Filipino kids, um, the kids from South America. So in that sense, there was another level of integration that was happening. Uh, this is my crew. Now, I'd like to show this picture because there were, for a long time, my friends didn't know I was Haitian immigrant. Um, and I didn't have to tell them, and they didn't ask, unless they came home and met my mother. And this was where most of the friction happened. Me trying to assimilate into American teenhood versus my mother trying to instill not necessarily cultural or Haitian values, but just some values, period. Um, I was not allowed to be Haitian. I was told to be American, but not too American, if that makes any sense, right? Study hard, right? Get into a good college, get scholarships, but don't go to the mall on the weekends, right? <laughs> um, you can participate in school activities, but no, you can't go hang out because there's pot out there, right? That's what my mother would think. You can, of course, you can um, watch American TV, but no boys can call you because you'll get pregnant, right? So this is, if anybody has an immigrant parent, these are like the exaggerations where we'll take some of American life, but not all of it. So in that sense, this was where it was the hardest for me. And I tried very hard to be tough girled. This was where most of the uh, rebellion 
this was when most of the rebellion happened and high schoolers are very interested about this part you know and when I'm in a, a room full of immigrant kids they all nod and raise their hands to say like you know their parents think the worst of what they might be doing right that they don't get to go out their parents are strict and this is where we make most of the connection during these teen years where I'm trying so hard to assimilate but my parents home values won't allow me to and this is where it was hardest for me something happened here something happened look immigrant American immigrant <laughs> I look <laughs> I look very immigrant I look very ethnic now um, so I'm gonna wrap it up here and say what happened here is I took college I was in college I was in college where I was taking an African-American literature class and we were reading about the Caribbean and Haiti came up Haitian history came up Haitian Vodou came up and guess who knew all the answers not me I had no idea what they were talking about because I did not learn any of it my mother did not pass on this information because the home country was so traumatizing to her that there was no reason to kind of reach back because her goal was to have me live the American dream so why reach back for for that sort of history when it was so painful especially when Haiti is on the news for natural disasters political corruption um, diseases why hold on to that right so here I am in a college classroom not having a clue about my own history and my own com culture and I was born there right so I felt so ashamed and embarrassed that I didn't know that from that point on I learned everything that I could possibly learn about in any given culture so this is me being culture cultural I became a hippie basically right <laughs> I was like rejecting everything American right um, if like if I had a cough I was not drinking Robitussin what herbs I was into herbs I was into crystals I was into everything anti-western because I was so angry about what I had not learned throughout elementary school and high school that I went way left of center and this is when I became essentially an artist a poet and a journalist looking for truth because of what I've been deprived of as an immigrant um, child I eventually learned about Edwidge Denty cat and this is me meeting my idol because that was the first time that I didn't have to reach so far to find my own culture it was right there within the pages of a book and the first book that I read from her was breath eyes memory and she mentioned my mother's hometown of Damari um, Haiti and I felt so incredibly validated that I didn't have to do all that left and center left of center stuff and I found balance and I was able to move forward with my chosen pa career path which was writing went to Haiti in 2010 after the earthquake first time as an adult remember them I thought they died in the earthquake because 300 thousand people died they lived in Port-au-Prince and I had not seen them since that picture was taken and I my mother and I searched everywhere until we looked on Facebook <laughs> and there they were and it was at that moment that my mother told me that that little girl was not my friend but my half-sister three months apart she did not know um, who her father was but then her family when she told confronted them they were like yeah yeah that's your dad um, traumatic for both of us she had just survived an earthquake so I had reason to go back to Haiti and when I did I conducted a workshop with teen girls because I had to give back in some way and these girls had just every single one of them la lost at least one family member in the earthquake and they did not know each other three days before this picture was taken they were um, chosen to participate in the workshop from different schools around Port-au-Prince and you see how they're all hugging each other that's culture to me uh, they did not know each other but they were bonded by a common experience and a common trauma and they were that's the resilience that the media likes to portray 
It's not that, you know, we can take a lot of hurt. It's that there is community. There is kind of, you know, this sort of camaraderie in the trauma. And these girls demonstrated that for me. I would not, I don't think I'd ever have this sort of bonding with teen girls here after only three days, right? And they had jokes for days. They were always laughing and had all sorts of witty jokes. Um, and after that earthquake is when I really decided this is what I wanted to do. I write, wanted to write for young people and I did an MFA in writing for children and young adults. That's my mother with the flowers and my three kids and my husband. Uh, this is a very uh, special moment for me because the first picture book that I published, um, an organization bought several copies to send to a preschool in Haiti. So all those girls were four, are four years old reading a picture book that I'd written. Um, and they were the age that they, they're the age that I was when I left Haiti. And that was full circle for me. This is my way of instilling, instilling cultural pride in my children so that they're never in a college classroom feeling that they did not learn something about who they are. In Trinidad. Trinidad, yes. My husband is um, Trinidadian Liberian. This is the first Haitian um, reader that I met when American Street was published. Her teacher brought her to me and said she just moved to her Virginia town and was the only Haitian student for miles around. And when she discovered that book, she felt less lonely in the world, right? According to her, what she said. My mother, the journalist. Now, the thing about um, immigrants is that we all know that many uh, immigrants come from their home countries with PhDs, um, with high degrees, with huge accomplishments, and they cannot live out their dreams in this country because of the language barrier and sometimes some of the red tape, the bureaucratic red tape that prevents them from doing what it is that they wanted to do in their home countries. Me in Miami, I never been to Haiti, but Miami is close enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> Me being Haitian, and I just added this picture. This is the corner of American Street and Joy Road in Detroit. And I will tell you in the Q&A, maybe someone will ask why I chose to write this sort of immigrant story in Detroit. And yes, the crew that you saw inspired the three Bs. Um, so all of that, it was inspiration. All this whole journey was inspiration for American Street. I went to Haiti when I was eight and to visit, and I was refused re-entry into the United States. I was not an American citizen, and my mother had to do all this paperwork to get me to come back. And I did not become a citizen until I was 19 years old, at which point I started college and did not get any financial aid because of that. So that is the end of my talk. And we're going to open to some Q&A. Wow, thanks so much, uh, Evie. I know some people have to go to class, so uh, feel free to, to leave if you have to. But we will open it up for Q&A, please. I want to say thank you for Thank you. Story, I hear your story and I see myself. Mm -hmm. So I came to the U.S. when I was five. Okay. From Haiti, so same oh, wow. Trajectory of, well, a lot of it is similar. Okay. Similar. If I could stay longer, I could get back to my office, but I, I would have things to share with you today. So thank thank you. Much. Thank you so much. And Evie will be part of the panel this afternoon. Just a reminder, I know Ted already mentioned, but Barnes & Noble will be selling copies of American Street as well as her more recent Pride and Patrick's book in the Shadow of Powers as well. So they're on a panel with Brandon Bird and Tiffany Patterson from Vanderbilt at 410 in the community room. So we will have a lot more time um, to talk with them and enjoy reception and book signing after the panel. But we do have to give back the room in a few minutes, so we probably have time for maybe two questions. Yes. Um, you mentioned that your mother didn't impart a lot of Haitian culture to you. I was wondering, did she that's a good question so my mother never spoke to me in Creole ever in my life she spoke about me in Creole to her <laughs> friends on the phone <laughs> you, you understand like there's the difference and um, I'd be right there in the room and she'd be like talking about me to someone else in Creole 
Um, so, but she only spoke in English to me, and it's a hard conversation to have with her. She regrets it, but she said she wanted to practice her English. There was one, there was one yeah, right here, and then, yeah? Mm -hmm. Identifying your your blackness, mm -hmm. and kind of finding what that is for you. Because so me and my family moved here. Um, one thing I struggled with was like with fitting in, fitting in obviously. Um, because like I mean I'm black, so like white like kids. Mm -hmm. you know, right, um, right. But then at the same time, like my black wasn't black enough because there was this like division. Between, right. Like, you know, Africans and African Americans. So I'm just curious to know like how you kind of navigated that. Interesting enough, I just edited an anthology called Black Enough, and it's 16 YA authors talking about the black experience. So I think I did not feel comfortable until I embraced global blackness. So until I connected with my Caribbean friends, my West African friends, and I was able to see the things that connected us all. So when I saw the common things, that's when I was able to embrace more of a global blackness, um, Afrocentric. Um, I felt more comfortable being Afrocentric than like in the 90s than embracing this sort of New York blackness or American blackness. And I found my tribe, um, other black kids who were artists, were, we, I, we shared that in common. So it's, I had to push back, push past American-centric idea of blackness, if you know what I mean. Yeah? Okay. Thank you for that question. You have one more? Yeah. I want mm -hmm. to know why Oh, Detroit. Okay, so yeah, I had asked her. So I, and I wanted to tell this story. If I wanted to make it modern day, I would have to set it in Bushwick because that's where I moved to. But Bushwick in 1980s, Bushwick now is not the same as it was in 1980s at all. It's completely gentrified. That block that I show you is probably very fancy right now with two, three million dollar buildings and brownstones. I would have to set it in 1980s and historical fiction with young people, it didn't, doesn't have the same impact because I wanted to make it immediate. But there was a New York Times article called Last Stop on the L Train Detroit. The L Train goes through Bushwick and the idea was that people could no longer afford Bushwick. So if they could no longer afford like this very last bastion of affordability in New York City, they could go to Detroit. <laughs> That's terrible, but there were ads telling people to go to Detroit because a lot of the buildings look like that now. Um, I mean, there's more green space in Detroit, but when I visited, there are whole fields that where, where houses once stood, where buildings once stood, and it looked very similar to what Brooklyn, um, Bushwick used to look like, um, and I needed to sell it in modern day city that's grappling with economics and unemployment and violence the same way it did, um, the same way New York City did in the 1970s and 80s. And there are immigrants in Detroit, there are Haitian immigrants in Detroit, and I discovered that there's an American street there, and that intersects with the Joy Road, and I thought that was a perfect setting for an immigrant story. Thank you so much. Thank you.